Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about a more recent conflict um, among you know, humans. Some government agencies maybe don't classify them as such, but they are more humans. Um, so in particular, we're t uh, I'm going to be talking about um, individual decision-making in conflict. Why do people decide to join armed groups, how they choose an armed group to join, and why do they leave and when? So, for example, imagine yourself as a normal, usual family living in one of those nice apartments in Aleppo before the war. And then the war started that you were not expecting at all, let's assume. And you have to decide. You have to have a family meeting or, like, friends meeting or whatever. You need to decide what you're going to do. What are your options? You could stay as a civilian, you could leave as a refugee, or you could stay as a fighter. Right? And then the, you, more complicated because you need to decide, you know, with whom to fight. So you basically have to have a you know, meeting or somehow decide what you're going to do. So that's exactly what I'm trying to understand. How th did they do that? Data collection. So this study is based on a um, survey, a survey 500 people, fighters, active fighters, um, active moderate fighters, active Islamist fighters, FSA, basically from FSA to Al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda, plus a focus group of ISIS fighters. Also interviewed civilians and refugees and wounded fighters in hospitals and ex-fighters who are not wounded. In addition, I collected uh, data on 40 brigades um, on their um, recruitment policies, a HR policies more broadly. For example, how do they recruit, how much they pay, like all the human resources problems and solutions they had. Problems with the methodology. Of course, there are problems. I'm not going to, you know, hide it. That first security, of course, but the second one, like actual methodological, is that we could not actually do a normal uh, random survey because we don't even know the population. Like, for example, serving like uh, armed groups in Syria, we don't even know how many armed groups are there. So we did a cluster sample, non probabilistic cluster sampling. And, of course, you know, IRB certification and... Uh, consent and they, they were also playing games, behavioral games, and they were paid for that except for Islamists because no money could be exchanged between you know, us and Islamists. So those guys were playing hypothetical games. Cluster sampling. So we were uh, working embedded with uh, re uh, already like rebels, uh, FSA plus Akhrarsham. So we were able to work on their, only on their territory. And on the example of Aleppo, we could see that we we had an approximation of what is controlled by those groups, like where we could actually go. So we chose uh, this, uh, I mean, we divided the town by clusters, and we sent enumerators to clusters. And they were, for example, civilians, they were interviewing one per, um, several per neighborhood by streets, but fighters, fighters were interviewed in a safe house, but in a safe house, like how does a safe house look like? It's a room where they're like li sitting on a floor because that's where they sit, and a TV. And in a room there would be like uh, five, seven fighters like resting. So we were interviewing one person per this room. So that's how we kind of tried to, you know, at least a little bit randomized. And um, so this was a territory controlled by rebels here. Here was uh, Assad territory, so we were not able to go there. And in Idlib uh, province, we also got uh, uh, rural territories. And it's important to mention that we were doing both Aleppo and Idlib because back then, Aleppo was a main front line. And Idlib was like a little bit safer and slower. Now it's opposite because Al-Nusra is controlling uh, Idlib. But back then, Idlib was a little bit safer front line. So it's, it was important to survey fighters both who self-selected into the worst front line and a little bit safer because Unlike U.S. Army, they don't have like MOSs, uh, different in military occupation specialties when they could go into the most dangerous ones and not. Here they're just choosing a front line. Uh, the sample was uh, balanced, which was a little bit actually surprised, surprising because we, you know, we didn't know actually what we're serving because we didn't know the population. Also, uh, because uh, we managed to get access to survey some people from a women sniper battalion, so we have. Uh, women fighters. So let's move to results immediately. First thing, why do people, so the questions we were trying to ask, why people fight, uh, how they choose a brigade, and why people stay as a civilian and or leave as refugees. We, how would we know that? We would ask, right? That's the first thing. Like, how would you, assume, like, we're not assuming, we're like asking them. They could talk, they're humans. So we did ask them, but there is another issue, like, Maybe we should not believe in them that much, 
because they're the, not the most trustworthy people in my life. So we also, it was actually a 40 pages survey, so I actually felt bad for those guys, 40 pages right along. But we had a lot of repetitive questions and like on the same topic, so we're like actually checking. So for example, there was a question like, did you join for money? And then there were questions, do you think that people who are fighting in your brigade and people who are not fighting in your brigade, there's a difference in like income and, and stuff. Just to cross check. But uh, you would be surprised how much downtime fighters have, so 40 pages did not seem so long especially when people who are serving you are two females. Um, so, um, and you're an Islamist. So, first result, why did, uh, for, about refugees, why did people decide to leave? And this one is like no surprise, people decided to leave because it's too dangerous to stay, it doesn't pay you anything, so like who in a normal mind will stay, right? So this one is very intuitive. Like, there is nothing holding me back, I'm going to leave, right? So we could see here that people left because it's too dangerous to stay, my family convinced me to leave, and like, I have a job, I need to support my family. Which is like, no surprise, right? Okay, then the surprise is going to be why people decided to stay, if the most obvious one is to leave. So why did people decide to stay? And here there are two important points. First, some people said that they, are stay they stayed because they need to protect their families and houses. For example, what do, you mean, what do I mean by protecting families? It's like if the, if the son decided to go fight, his mom will stay, like with him in Syria. So in that sense, or like brothers, like two brothers decide to stay, the third one is gonna you know, also stay because of the family, he's not gonna go alone. And, um, but this is the important part here, is staying to support fighters and staying to fight. Important, those are civilians. Like they are not holding a weapon. And they were never ever me members of any brigades. So what does they actually mean by that? So we asked them, if you stayed, why you didn't join? Like, what are you doing here? Like, what's your role? How do you see yourself as a civilian in a conflict right now? Especially if you told us that you, are, you stayed to fight and support fighters. So we asked them why you didn't join. So they, they, they're afraid what's gonna happen to them. They and don't support the goal, so they don't want to be under the flag, right, of a particular brigade, and they don't have combat skills. And it would sound like, oh no, I'm not gonna fight, I don't know how to do it, sorry, right? So we went into more details about that, and apparently, like, they were thinking the fall, their, their way of thinking about that is, if I was a baker for five years in Aleppo, I could, I could take a weapon right now and gonna go fight, but I'm gonna be rather bad soldier, like I never did it, right? But fighters have to eat something. So I'm going to stay and continue making bread for fighters. So that was like their line of reasoning. So they stayed as a uh, infantry, like logistical infantry support. Like because of fighters, they were actually going to battles. But like in US Army, I think it's people who are actually fighting, that's not so many. There are a lot of like big logistics machine, you know, combat support units. They don't have that. So they're relying on civilians about that. So that's what civilians stayed there for when they said we stayed to support the fighting. So why did other people join? And I want you to first look here. Uh, he, uh, here are moderate brigades, uh, FSA. Why did they join? To take revenge against Assad, to defend the community, and because Assad must be defeated. Very emotionally kind of loaded, like I stayed revenge. Like the word revenge is rather emotional to me. And it's their like, main idea why they joined. Because on revenge, they're scoring way more than civilians. Then, let's, so, so they, stay, like, they joined for the goal. They would be like, I'm gonna die for this goal. Uh, Islamists. Let's look at Islamists. And I want to repeat, it's Al-Nusra, uh, Al Al-Qaeda affiliate in, in uh, Syria, and Ahrar al-Sham. Also very Islamic, but not classified as terrorist organization. So, what are their main goals? Same, I uh, except for Islam and like the goals, I'm gonna talk about it later. Assad must be defeated to defend community, revenge. Same stuff, right? I mean, basically. Plus Islam and goals of the group. But those are hardcore Islamists, like in the sense of like their flag is like very known to everyone. So we're like, maybe they are, I mean, that's something they have to say. So how could I trust them that they're saying they're fighting for Islam? So we ask one more question. Uh, why, did you think, why do you think most people in your group joined? Like, of course, you are so cool Islamists and you're fighting for Islam. Like, yes, you are like 
the one. But what about others? Because we thought that he, they're going to be more likely to speak openly about others. And Islam left from top three options. So they are the same. Uh, to defend the community, Assad must be defeated, and revenge. So basically, yeah, I'm so like cool Islamist, but like everyone else in my group, I actually fighting for the same thing as FSA is fighting. So when the war started in the beginning, there was like no money, they were supporting themselves. So they were choosing between uh, to go fight and not to fight based on their motivation, their goal, right? If it was high, if they really wanted to defend, they joined. If it was not, they didn't. But when there was a full scale conflict and then they ran out, ran out of their own money, and they had to, you know, like get food for their family and so on. And there, a lot of brigades started to appear and they become a little bit different because of the different money sources, different leadership. You know, some leaders totally, like, absolutely could not lead anything. And uh, corruption again. You know, the different, in like, brigades become different as institutions. So they, and then fighters, with, um, had to rethink the, uh, what brigade they want to fight with. And it, it became an open market, so um, some people stayed with their group and some people switched to other groups. So we asked, why did you join this particular group? And by now, people switched group like three, four times. We know people who switch like seven times, but usually it's like three more, uh, three, four. So why did you choose your particular group? And the answers here are very like institution related. So like, if something happens to me, the group will help me. It has nothing to do with a flag, with a goal. It's, um, this group is like better organized. They have a uh, support. The, I like the leaders. Um, my friends joined particular this group, so I went with them. Like, there is nothing about actually, you know, ideology or the flag of the group. And the similar thing about why did you switch? Uh, why did you switch between groups? Because the second group was, um, I mean, the most important thing, uh, care um, for fighters. So if you get wounded, are they going to care for you? And on this thi thing exactly, uh, that's, that's exactly what Al-Nusra is... Uh, winning on in Syria right now. They actually do care about their fighters, so a lot of people want, who still want to continue fighting, they prefer to switch to Al-Nusra. Because as an institution, it's way better functioning than other brigades. Okay, so why do the people then quit? And <clears throat> a lot of people realized, basically they got disappointed either in themselves and in relation to fighting. Like, I, you know, like I was really bad at it. Like, it, it, it didn't help anyone. Like, I was just sitting there and, it, you know, I could not actually affect what's going on. Um, well they were disappointed. Like, they, they think that the war is not going anywhere. Plus, they were also disappointed in their brigades, but in that sense, they could switch to another one. But, like, in general, they were upset with the, the, with the goal part. So they left. And another question to kind of double check was what, what should happen for you to, so you're going to consider returning to fight, which is extremely important right now with our train and equip program that does not go that well. And uh, basically people think that, uh, people told us that they're going to consider going back if their idea of the goal is going to be restored. So for example, is, if West is going to help them, but also, you know, brigade institution should be good. So basically, uh, getting back to this picture, people are deciding about their um, participation based on the goal. But after they got in, like they decided to actually go and fight, they're choosing their brigade based on the brigade as an institution. So there are two different ideas. Like, for example, as a grad student, first I decided to become a political scientist, and then I applied to different schools. You know, but it was only after I decided to become a political scientist. And uh, some schools admitted me, and then I was looking, okay, who has a better scholarship? Who has uh, better advisors? But it was only after, and, you know, if I'm going to consider leaving the profession, it's going to be because I got disappointed in the, the whole idea. So similar thing here about the decision-making on participation. So that's it. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Huh? So six minutes, Christina. 
I'm mm-hmm. breaking your chest fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I just want to move it back to the language. Okay, thank you. Yeah, did you do any uh, profile analysis of the differences in the motivation between fighters in Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS? ISIS is a very different thing. So for ISIS, we interviewed foreign fighters. But like it's a usual labor market, they have a different incentive why, they, why foreign worker, for example, consider, like, consider yourself going to another country to work. You have a very different incentive from people from that, that particular country to work there. So they are not in this particular labor market. They have a very separate, uh, a separate motivation for foreign fighters. So they could not be actually, um, it's, it's only among Syrians. Mm-hmm. But not all ISIS members are foreign fighters. I mean, they're native-born. Absolutely. We were Syrian. not being able to get access to Syrian. Uh, Syrian. Uh, I, I mean, we interviewed, like, anecdotally, we interviewed some defectors from ISIS, um, but n- we were not able to get access to survey uh, Syrian ISIS. Mm-hmm. Who switch? Uh, ISIS. ISIS, in order to be brutal, they, they sent, so there are Syrians who they were fighting in Iraq or somewhere else, they wouldn't be fighting in Syria. No, they, they, a lot of them stay actually what town they joined in. They're, like if they're from Raqqa, they're going to stay in Raqqa. Yeah. They actually use it as punishment. They use um, as punishment resending them to another town. So if he, if he doesn't perform well, they're going to reassign him to like um, Godforsaken Village. That was a really interesting talk, and I was curious in particular about your last set of slides <clears throat> about people's reasons for stopping their participation. Sorry. Yeah, it's close, close to the end. Yeah. Yeah, that one. That's great. I mean, when I look at that, it almost looks like we, you know, you've got there the makings of a taxonomy of confidence. It's the opposite of c- confidence here, but it's you know, co- confidence in your own skills, Confidence in your own small fighting group. Confidence in the cause. In, you know, I mean, in relation to the whole, like, confidence in myself in relation to the whole goal, like, could I do something to help win? That's exactly right, yeah. So I was just wondering if, you know, if, if Dominic, if you saw some things here that um, you, you've been able to pick up as more sort of generalities about, you know, sort of the dimensions of confidence that really end up mattering. Uh, there, there's two things. One is the negativity bias. So there's the optimism bias, but there's also the negativity bias. The negativity bias um, seem that we have um, sort of very gloomy perspectives on threats in our environment. But when we think of ourselves, we tend to be optimistic. So if, if the world turns bad, we can be actually uh, underconfident about it. Um, I mean, the other thing that's coming to my mind, Mike, is uh, learned helplessness, but not quite sure what to say about it, other than that there are known sort of cognitive mechanisms which might um, generate these kinds of behaviours if you've um, suffered and you have not been able to control your, um, your environment. Yeah, um, I was curious also on this slide, I'm kind of surprised by the number of people that admitted that the group basically kicked them out. Almost 30% of people responded that was one of the reasons, right? Um, I wonder though, even though that's to me seems a fairly large number, whether you think there still might be additional underreporting there. And did you ask the same question, why do you think other people quit um, on this particular set of issues? Yes, we, d- we did. I, I don't remember uh, actual tables. I, I, we did ask that, but it's not surprising at all that they were kicked. They're kicking out a lot of people. Because first of all, a lot of fighters are, if it's like goal-motivated brigade that is actually fighting someone, they could be fighters who are into looting, and that's the only thing they want. Or they're sitting there to get funding because they need to feed their family. And they're mistreating civilians. So there is 
a lot of internal policing in a group. So being kicked out, it's a very no normal thing. It's very, it happens all the time. Like Al-Nusra actually is the one that's, that's kicking out a lot of fighters. Because they're expensive, it's human resources, you have to pay them salaries, so you prefer to have only the best ones. You're not gonna spend money I, on them. I, ju I just have a comment. First, awesome field work, and I really enjoyed your talk. But in looking at some of your data, I have sort of difficulty parsing like 48.5 versus 51.0 or 52.1. So when or if you go back, one method that sometimes used successfully in anthropology is sort of a text analysis on narratives, where instead of maybe, I'm assuming from this you're giving people choices, but you could ask them just to open and that discuss whatever reasons and sort of see what what comes out, and you may, uh, maybe you'll find the exact same thing, but maybe you'll sort of discover something different. And um, so anyway, I think it's just worth thinking about. We, I mean, we did with ISIS because, uh, but with those guys, we have a 40 pages survey. It's like, it would take forever. But also we always ask, uh, when we ask them like, just name whatever you agree with, we also say which one is the most important one. I just didn't present all questions, but we always ask which one is the most important reason, which one is to give one number. So that's kind of we're trying to go around it. But open-ended questions, I mean, especially if they want to talk to you and they're rather bored, you're going to stay there forever. It's not going to, it's not feasible. It's not a nice place to stay there forever. So one of the things that um, strikes me in, in your results, which is really interesting, is um, the seemingly irrational behavior, at least on the surface. Um, and so I had two questions. One is, why would individuals join combat units when they don't have the skills necessary for combat? Um, and then why would groups not take care of their recruits when that turns out to be the most important reason for individuals to stay with a unit? A uh, couple of reasons for um, the second one, because I was very interesting second one because that's exactly how Al Nusra manages to get all the FSA fighters into its base. Some of the brigades are for profit. They are corrupt. So they don't care about their people. They just they need one thing. They don't care what's gonna happen. Some have a really terrible leaders because leaders just don't know how to take care. Like they don't or they don't have money or by taking care it's an important issue here is medical. They don't have, it's not possible. They don't have doctors. So even if they want, you remember there was like an ad from ISIS going like in English, like a legit, you know, American style ad saying like foreign doctors, pr please come, we're paying. ISIS was like offering, I think, $3,000 for doctors to come to work in their hospitals. $3,000 a month. There's like some things they just could not, they don't have a like, institutional, like to institutionalize it. Like right now, private hospitals exist only for Ahrar al-Sham and al-Nusra. Those are two big, I mean, and ISIS live its own life. But only those two things could, uh, those two groups have their own private hospitals for their own fighters.